I'm um, just here as a, um, introducing the, the session. I mean, my name is Robert Nazi. I'm the Deputy Director General of Research in C4. And um, I will just make a quick introduction and I will step down because I'm also the reporter of the session, so I have to take some notes. Uh, and I will leave uh, people in the able ends of MONA, our facilitator. The, this session is organized in the, in the framework of a, a DFID funded project, which is the NO4. Uh, which is a project funded from the uh, UK International uh, Climate Fund, which is a four billion pounds facility uh, um, provided by, by the DFID. Uh, and, and the actual uh, DF, uh, NOFOR project runs from 2012 to 2015. And it really seeks to address the, the gap between uh, knowledge products that are generated and the uptake of these knowledge products is really looking at this uptake question about how do we equip a policymaker, practitioner, with the very nice results from the research so that we don't let them sitting on the shelves to be eaten by the termites and they can get used by the people to, to implement a thing on the ground. And, and the whole idea of this session is to show you some of the tools that were developed, these knowledge product tools that were developed as part of the NOFOR project and, and have some discussion with people that are, that are proponent of the tool and some people that are adopter of the tools and, and, and to show how it can work and, and, and how you can transfer knowledge product uh, into uh, outcomes and implementation. And I forgot to say that the, there are three main partners in, in NOFOR, uh, IUCN, C4, and uh, PRO4, the Program on Forest and the, the World Bank. Having said that, uh, I think I finished my time and I will ask Mona to come and introduce the panelists and uh, start the, the work. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon, and welcome uh, to this very exciting session, which, as Robert said, we're going to be sharing ideas and experiences on very innovative tools on for uh, landscapes management, for advancing landscapes management. And we've got a very uh, interesting line of speakers with us here today. And uh, to start things off, we're going to be introducing the speakers. Each of them will be giving off a 15-minute presentation. And then afterwards, we'll be opening up uh, the space for discussions and any questions you might have. So for the speakers, we'll be having Eric Fernandez and Rodrigo Lima. Eric is the Agricultural Advisor at the World Bank Group. And Rodrigo is the General Manager at the Institute for International Trade Negotiations. They'll be discussing the decision support tools for sustainable and climate resilient agriculture. And then we will have a discussion by a presentation by Patrick Wiley, who is the Senior Forest Policy uh, Officer. And he'll be discussing assessing forest landscape restoration opportunities. Third is Sven Wonder, Principal Economist at C4, who will be talking about poverty and environment network. And I'd like to invite our panelists up to the floor so we can start. Thank you. So first off, we'll be hearing from, from Eric and Rodrigo. Do you need a PowerPoint presentation? It's already on. OK, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's great to see all of you here. And I see more people coming in even as we, as we speak. So I'm, uh, I'm going to start with a PowerPoint and, and just present some of the results a very interesting study that we did. Um, we, uh, in the World Bank, we, all we did was to facilitate the interaction of some very important agencies in Brazil, as you can see the Embrapa, which is the National Agricultural Research Agency, um, Unicampi, which is this very important university in Sao Paulo state that does a lot of the training, capacity enhancement of the young generation students. Um, Agroecony, Andrea Nassar and Leila Fu. But I have today here one of the general managers, Rodrigo, who's been, who's in the, uh, who is in Lima for the COP, and he's kindly agreed to 
represent the agroeconomy. Uh, then we have INPE, the Brazilian Space Research Institute. So you can see our agency, and it's, it's really quite important uh, collection of agencies, and the idea was to sort of bring together this very esteemed, very powerful, very very important group of agencies and try and address this important question, how does Brazil get ready for some of the changes that are coming uh, in terms of its, uh, its agriculture uh, nationwide. Um, the framework uh, for decision policy making, uh, I think, uh, how, what, uh, how did we go about doing this? And uh, one of the aspects of this uh, session was to present some of the methodologies. Um, so uh, that's, that's why I'm going to do a little bit of this. Uh, basically, get good data, um, uh, take that data and, and use it in, in, in the best available couple models, uh, and then do that in a spatially uh, representative way uh, and link that to economic uh, uh, scenarios. And, and that was one way we felt would be important to provide uh, some of the, the data and the knowledge necessary for policy making. Um, so we started off by accessing and incorporating some of the best hydrometeorological data in, in the sub-regions in Brazil. Uh, and what does this mean? It, it, in, for Brazil, it's 1,200 stations uh, with, about, with data of about 20, 25 to 30 years that has been quality checked for about, till about uh, 2007. So that gives you an idea of the, of the depth of data that, that's required often if you want to do a good job, and that's not the case for many, many countries. Um, nevertheless, it was important to bring all of this together. Um, uh, then we took uh, that data and we sort of started to refine some of the global re and regional local scale models that Brazil has. The, the, there's the global models that most of us use but Brazil has been working very diligently on, on three or four regional models, and they have very, very high resolution local weather models that we brought together. So this is pushing the state of the art in terms of what's available. Uh, and then we looked at uh, what it was uh, that the national agricultural uh, uh, folks were using in terms of supporting rural credit and agricultural credit. And there is a national model that most of the rural credit banks and rural uh, banks uh, use. Uh, and uh, basically, it was a way for us to sort of have an input to something that's ongoing, that's available, that's actually being used in the country to support agriculture. And, uh, and this is where we then couple that with the land use, Brazilian land use model that uh, Agroeconi has developed. This is essentially an, an, an a way to put economic value, values on this and have a very powerful partial equilibrium economic model uh, which actually looks at land, looks at agricultural supply demand, and, and puts some economic values on it. So you can see this is really the kind of the conceptual framework, the methodological framework that we use. Uh, an important, important aspect of, of, of this, you know, how does this link to the landscape, some of you may be thinking. Uh, and this is another vision of a landscape. This is a subcontinental scale landscape. Brazil has uh, many, many biomes, as you know, as you go from the southern part at the bottom, which is subtropical sub temperate, uh, the, some grasslands there. The, uh, very quickly, you get into some of the, that yellow region there. That's uh, that's the uh, Cerrado. That's the savanna, um, and then in, in the big green blob at the top, which is the the Amazon. Uh, and those are just three that I've highlighted. But you can see there, this Brazil has the data, has this agroecozone, uh, and this is basically a variety of intersecting watersheds, micro watersheds, watersheds, landscapes, basins. Uh, and and, and so we could do that in, in fairly quantitative terms, biophysical quantitative terms, uh, but then overlay that with a lot of the land use that's going on. The, the green little, that little map in the middle in the bottom and that green shading is what's by the Brazilian legal framework, and Rodrigo will get into some of this, uh, is, is the legally permissible U, uh, area that uh, people can actually work with. The rest needs to be kept by the Brazilian Forest Code and Land Use Code uh, to be kept in pristine uh, vegetation. So it's important to bring all this, these data layers together um, at the subcontinental scale of Brazil, which goes from the south to the north uh, and east to west, as you can see, the, uh, and, and, and encompasses a range of these landscapes. And all of these have been published uh, this year in, 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 a, in a study that you can download off the Profor site. The link is down there, but you know, if anybody is interested, let me know. We can send you the, the study. Uh, let me send uh, br briefly then. I'll, I'll, I don't want to sort of uh, belabor what's on the, the, on the, f on the, the five points on the right. 
uh, we've just discussed how we put together the, the different uh, layers, the methods, et cetera. Uh, uh, what I want to sort of just show you is those different shadings. The top three figures, uh, that as you go from left to right, represent a baseline and then a 2030, 2050 scenario. Uh, so we were looking at, uh, at scenarios uh, down the road, but not going too far, like the climate models that go to the end of the century, 2100. In terms of policy makers, that becomes really difficult for them to get their, their minds and other things around. So we started to sort of take a much more pragmatic look at 2030 uh, in the first instance and 2050 later on. So the first one is pasture, the second one, I can't see it from here, but I think it's corn and, and soybeans. So basically that's, that's what you get uh, you know, with uh, very precise uh, data, almost down to municipal level. That's the, the advantage of the data sets we were able to access. Um, a very important conclusion from that study was that top south uh, data, the blue, uh, blue number in the first original column is, is, is a kind of baseline. That's the uh, area, millions of hectares available of the class A uh, land in Brazil. This is the best agricultural land. And then if you look uh, towards the right, you've got pessimistic, optimistic scenarios and Brahms, that's the Brazil Brazilian uh, development of regional uh, atmospheric model. It's a very high resolution model that they use. So we've got various models going in here. But the, the take home figure there is that you've got in essence from 32 million hectares, you can see that uh, the projection is for declining class A land. And a lot of that is gonna be in the south. So that's the grain belt of Brazil. And, and that in itself is, is an important landscape scale issue because that means something is gonna have to be done. Um, in terms of production, uh, apart from the area, you can see the same sort of thing there. The red figures represent in the south a decline in projected productivity globally, uh, uh, nationally. Um, here for a range of crops, again, I don't want you to sort of focus on the numbers, but as you, uh, the, the key uh, implications of this study was that uh, significant projected ag uh, productivity declines in, in, in the absence of adaptation. A lot of the simulation was done without projected adaptation. Um, the projected uh, uh, agricultural prices will rise based on the economic model, and this has to do both with national supply demand as well as global supply demand. Uh, increased ag prices mean that Brazilian ag contribution to the economy, despite the projected decline in productivity, will actually increase, will double. And so those who produce might be in a good position, those who have to buy their food, not so much. And if you're looking, and in the World Bank, uh, reduction of extreme poverty and, and, and shared benefits is in our important goals, this becomes an important issue uh, in terms of social policy, political uh, and economic, the economic policy issues. Um, significantly larger price impacts if other countries or, and regions are, are impacted. Uh, and there is this possibility that unless the right policies are in place, you have food production at the expense of forests. And those who are sort of concerned about what happens to mitigation, et cetera, that's an issue. Um, I'm gonna sort of present some of the broader issues and policy implications, then hand over to Rodrigo here, who's, a, uh, who's who, We've put together sort of a presentation that he will present some of the views of how this data then feeds into policy. So from a user's perspective, uh, what I've presented is what the, what the science agencies did. And here, hopefully, you can, you can hear from Rodrigo after this. So uh, as I've said, the climate change is likely to have, that's my time. Um, is, 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 is climate change is likely to have increasingly significant and mostly negative impacts on the major grain and pasture systems in Brazil. Um, there's the reduction uh, uh, of, cl of climate risk, um, of, of not climate risk, of low, of low risk cropland, um, uh, and, and most of that takes place in the south, which is the big agricultural growing land, and that's, this, that's a spatially relevant outcome that, is, that has major uh, policy implications for Brazil, and I'll show you one slide as to why. Um, and then in the pessimistic scenario, you can see here, that, uh, uh, that although, uh, well, we've covered that. So the, five, the, the southern region losing some of those, that hectare. Now, I've, I've pointed out why this is important because, let me see if this works, yeah. So most of the grain growing region is here. You can see the distance to ports goes from 500 to 200 kilometers. The projected grain growing is gonna be here, uh, and that goes to 1,000, 2,000 kilometers from the port on these kinds of roads. So 
this kind of information at these uh, subcontinental landscape scale across several biomes is, is, is critical because it's, if you're going to put in place the kind of infrastructure and the, and the, and the, and the conditions, the logistic, the value added, the social participation, the social safety nets, you need to be able to have this kind of information very, very quickly. And, and, and you need probably a decade or two to be able to put that in place. So this is the kind of information we have to provide for our civil society, for our governments, for, 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 for partners in the world. Actually, this is interesting. There's a lot of ongoing work now where this kind of stuff, as you can see here, you know, on the up, the very degraded pastures uh, can be taken to these kinds of systems in, within 10 years. Uh, and there are, uh, there are many, many uh, teams, many uh, agencies currently developing these tremendously vibrant, productive, uh, we need the policies to put in place now using that kind of information uh, in the short to medium term. Thank you very much. Now I'll hand over to Rodrigo. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eric. Um, I'll try to touch upon some, some of the highlights. Eric mentioned trying to, to, to present how important it is for Brazil and for every country, actually, to have inputs from studies like this one, uh, aiming to deal with landscape in a win-win approach, in a mutual gains approach, not just for production, but for conservation and for food security and for livelihoods and for poverty reduction. And to do that, it's able to start. It's necessary to have a start and to have an initial step. We're talking today in the morning that 10 years ago, a reality in Brazil to try to manage and to try to understand the impacts of climate change was completely different from the moment we are, we are, we are living today. So the idea here is setting the challenges because agriculture is, is a very important sector in Brazil and not just because uh, we need to eat but because we export food a lot. Uh, represents 22% of our GDP right now. Uh, we, Brazil is the larger exporter of soybeans, bro uh, broiler, beef, sugar. Um, there's an increasing domestic demand, higher income and population. There's the ability to expand production, increase conservation, and maybe achieve what we call a zero net deforestation. So we're cutting down deforestation and we are recovering degraded forest and, and land that, that was converted illegally there's this challenge of the implementation of the, the new forest code right now. So we, we, we are today dealing, dealing with this zero net deforestation. So at the landscape level, how to make it happen, thinking about that climate change is a, it's a real threat. And so climate change threatens food, energy, water security, and livelihoods. Uh, Uncertainties and lack of consistent data and analysis about climate change, extreme events and impacts on agriculture, different regional effects, global and, and at the global and at the local level. So the idea of the study, how Eric presented, was to integrate different models. And uh, what we did, simulating climate change scenarios, uh, what will happen with the aim to understand what will happen. Uh, in the Brazilian land use and agricultural production dynamics, considering potential risks of climate change, uh, and what are the impacts on prices and, and production value. So uh, Eric already touched upon basically all of these aspects, but uh, the, the, this Brazilian land use model we developed at Agroecony years back uh, as an econometric model to try to understand what's happening with supply and demand, but bringing land use as one of the pillars of this model because we, we, we need to look to Brazil as a whole, divided in the six regions we have based on the biomes, 
and to understand how these different crops will work uh, given uh, supply and demand inside the country, outside the country, and how it will be impacted by climate change. So uh, there's the different scenarios, uh, the baseline, the pessimistic based on the IPCC A2, the optimistic on the B2 scenario, and the brands without precipitation and with precipitation. Um, considering the inputs from Embrapa and from Unicamp, University of Campinas, using an allocation methodology uh, with similar structure as the Brazilian land use mo model, uh, divided by six regions, 26 states and, and 50, uh, 558 regions, and combining the impacts on agriculture Products simulated, there's 11, 12 different products in the model each in each municipality and trying really to understand how this is working uh, under climate change uh, scenarios and, and different impacts. This is uh, to, to highlight, there's the baseline scenario for uh, 2030 and, and the pessimistic and the optimistic. And, and the idea here is just to highlight that some of the, uh, the main producing areas, regions in Brazil, will really lose land because the climate change impacts. Uh, I'm from the south of Brazil, the state of Paraná. There's three states in the south, and the three states are so important in terms of egg production. And the figures shows that uh, total area suitable for agriculture and pasture will be reduced under the climate change, change scenarios. Not just the pessimistic, the optimistic also. Land use for crops, uh, excluding sugarcane, in 2030 might potentially be decreased by two to 10 million hectares compared to uh, 2009. Imagine losing up to 10 million hectares for cropland, it's huge. We have 60 million hectares for cropland as a as a uh, an average and imagine up to 10 million this is a lot and up to 5 million may, might happen in the south of brazil what are the impacts uh, one thing is to look at the broad picture but we need to look at the regional scale and 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 the impacts on livelihoods and poverty on small small farmers Despite land, land use reduction from up, despite land use reduction from seven up to 20, 23 million hectares, part of the land loss might be accommodated by pasture land intensification and this regional production reallocation. But this is not easy and we must have policies in place to really make it happen. <coughs> Sorry. Suitable land will be reduced mainly in the south, up to 5 million, which is huge, the northeast coast and the, the northeast Cerrado. Strong li livestock intensification from 7, up to 7 to 9 million hectares of pasture will be displaced and give place to crops. This is very good because there's cattle intensification going on. Yeah, I'm, I'm finishing. And, and, and just to, to close, production reallocated to regions with less impacts, higher meat prices due to intensification process and also crop prices increase. And, and, and livestock intensification is crucial at the end. Production increase might occur only combined with pasture intensification, again the prices. Since there is regional reallocation of production combined with production loss, climate change can increase poverty and food insecurity, which is so bad and policies must be in place to deal with that, thinking about uh, uh, using a mitigation adaptation approach. Additional investments need for cattle intensification. And just really to close, thinking about the three questions presented for our, our, our workshop now, uh, I, I made some 
some reflections. Land use planning is a key figure of how countries will be able to manage climate change impacts and adaptation needs, fostering mitigation potential while addressing food security and conservation needs. Tools must be developed and consistently improved, aiming to address regional and local impacts and to support strategic planning policies. And this uh, consistently improved means that there's a lot, a lot of things to be done, and there's another, a lot of layers of information that must be, uh, be seen together to be able to get to better understanding of, of the problems. Uh, we are now in a new phase of the Brazilian land use model, doing different studies, and one of them is for the Brazilian government in an in a, in a adaptation strategy that is being discussed. It's a kind of an, a second phase of this study. Uh, there's the Brazil's role under the UNFCCC new protocol or agreement, and, and also on the SDGs agenda and how land use and agriculture will be tackled, adaptation and mitigation approach plus red plus, how, how really to manage those aspects in, in the landscape. Priority areas for production and priority areas for conservation, policies and projects on the ground, because there's, it is possible to balance and to have, and to achieve a zero net deforestation to maximize conservation and production, trying to really diminish, reduce the risks of climate change. And suitable pastures as a key driver. Uh, policies to promote pasture restoration, we are starting to do that. Livestock intensification, pastures to crops and pastures to protected areas because pasture is the key element to really balance and to really increase conservation and production in Brazil. Those are my, my reflections, thank you. Thank you, Rodrigo and Eric, for this. And next up, we'll be hearing from Patrick Wiley, who is the Senior Forest Policy Officer at IUCN. And uh, if you have any questions, please, we're, we'll be having the discussion towards the end of the session, so please note them down. There we go. Try that again. OK, so thanks. And I might modify my, my presentation a little bit just because I know we're a little bit behind time just because downstairs the, the rich discussion and some of the parallels started differently. Also, it's the middle of the afternoon, so I thought what we could do, um, we have a number of tools and I think one of the nice things about No4 um, as a project, which is the three organizations of Pro4, C4, and IUCN working together under this DFID-led work, is there's a variety of tools, many of which overlap. Um, so I'm probably going to skip a little bit the, the deeply technical pieces that are underpinned in, in one of the tools that we're going to profile here. But I thought we could start with a short video of about two minutes. And if you bear with me for two minutes, I promise that you will get the summary of the last two minutes without having to listen to it. So if you could play the first two minutes um, with the audio on and then just mute it, please. All land managers, owners, and tenants struggle to answer the same question. How can we meet our need for food, fuel, and fiber in a way that's both sustainable and climate resilient? Land is finite, but the demands against it are diverse and growing. Decision makers are now looking for new ways to meet their many national goals and international commitments. Restoring degraded and deforested lands may be one way to meet these seemingly competing needs. Across the planet, more than 2 billion hectares of degraded land offer little for humans or nature. We can bring health and productivity back to these lands and prepare for the needs of the future. But where to start and how to proceed? Introducing the Restoration Opportunity Assessment Methodology, or ROAM in English. ROAM is a flexible framework for identifying restoration opportunities at national and subnational levels. Rome can help countries, institutions, and individuals identify the best places to begin restoration, as well as what strategies to employ in different regions. Rome explains how these strategies can serve important goals for rural development, biodiversity conservation, and food, energy, and water security. 
The process begins when an entity with the rights to manage land decides they might want to restore a portion of it. They will ask the question, what are the main problems caused by degradation? And they'll try to identify the goals of successful intervention. With these goals in mind, a first-rate assessment team can be assembled, composed of a leader, an economist, a land use specialist, and a social scientist, all coordinated through the most appropriate national institution. This team will meet with key stakeholders and local experts to understand the required scope of the assessment. Will the goal be to improve water flows downstream or to improve crop yields or wildlife habitat? Restoration activities can be balanced to bring many diverse benefits. Stakeholders are active participants in each stage of the room process. Next, the team and its local advisors will identify the kinds of degraded land in the assessment area. So if you can just mute it and you can actually let it keep playing. So that those that don't want to listen to what I have to say have some pretty pictures moving off to the side. Um, so you can just press play and turn the volume down. Um, I think for us at the surface, you know, I saw a couple smiles which meant you either liked the video or you thought that it didn't quite work for you and that it might have missed the mark for some of the technical audience. And I think that's one of the things that's been nice about the No4 process um, for us is that this project focuses a lot on uptake pathways. So how are we actually going to get different activities and behavioral changes from different groups? And so often we have a product that says, oh, my audience is A, B, and C. Well, chances are you probably can only have audience A, audience B, audience C to access them effectively. I think this is where some of the leaping off points are um, in the tool. So if, if you could press play um, on the video and just turn off the sound. And determine the most appropriate interventions to restore each type. Then, they will gather and analyze data on the physical and ecological aspects of the land, social and economic factors, and on the... In any case, as we sort out how that's going to go, it's part of the organic process that we have as well, I think, through the restoration opportunities assessment methodology, is that it's not a manual um, or a recipe book on how to go about restoration. And so one of the things that we've been really focused on is demand-led. Um, so when I was reflecting on this session about what to say um, about this one of many tools that IUCN is developing under this portion of No4, our challenge was actually how are we going to get a how are we going to get an implementer or a user w during the negotiations? Who's going to actually speak? And we actually reflect on the fact that at Forest Day in, in Doha, we had almost the identical panel. I'm talking about the restoration opportunities assessment methodology. And so what's changed? I think a couple things have changed on the demand side. You know, the first thing that we have in front of us is that today we're able to launch this in French and Spanish in addition to English, which has been out. And that's available in hard copy outside in the booth as well as on our website of IUCN.org. And so that's a really exciting thing is that all our materials now are in French, English, and Spanish with Portuguese coming in the new year. I think a, a real fundamental piece, though, on the demand side of all of this is actually the, the opportunity for restoration in multilateral finance has been, un, I would say, unparalleled. We saw at the Climate Summit in September in New York um, discussing about the role of degradation and, and specifically restoration of up to uh, 150 million hectares by 2020, the Bond Challenge Goal, but more specifically, uh, an expansion of that by 200 million hectares by 2030. So 350 million hectares by 2030. We see in the multilateral arenas of the Forest Carbon Partnership Facility, in the Biocarbon Fund, large-scale finance, which a number of people up here and in the audience know about and others don't, where tens of millions of dollars are going to countries to work on uh, programs for restoring degraded land, be that improved cacao production in Ghana, be that more sustainable woodlot systems in Chile. How, what's the main step in accessing that money? You know, downstairs people said it's just trying to connect, I think it was Peter uh, Holmgren that said, how do we connect the money to those that are actually possibly going to do the work? And the barrier at the most fundamental level is documenting the existing level of degradation and understanding how that's going to change going forward. And that's one of the demand-led tools that we think uh, that we've been able to develop here through experiential learning, which is a large part of what 
um, DFID No4 has allowed us to do, working with the governments of Ghana, Guatemala, Mexico, Rwanda, um, ongoing work in Me uh, ongoing work that's emerging in a number of new countries. And I think what's really what's really powerful about this, and I won't go into the specific details of the tool itself, because I think a lot of what was given in the first panel got into it, combining best economic data. So what are the what are, of the trade-offs that we often face? We talk about agricultural, we talk about forestry, we talk about water and other existing ecosystem services that have markets. The challenge isn't as one, uh, when we launched uh, a number of years ago, when we launched the World of Opportunities map, identifying two billion hectares globally, um, WRI, IUCN, a number of other partners, and as that work continues, the initial reaction of many people is, I know that we have degraded lands. I know where the degraded lands are in my country. The problem is I don't have a definition, and I don't know how to actually go about convincing other people around the decision-making table, other than the Minister of Forests, to let me do it. So the way to do that is to help start documenting some of the, the actual outputs in something other than tons of carbon, cubic meters of wood, or of um, emissions reductions going forward. And so as we start looking at some of the balancing the indicators and generating some of the information on jobs, on GDP growth, so 2 billion hectares globally roughly generates $85 billion a year in GDP. That's starting to become a powerful question, a, a powerful proposition. So what's that at the national level? And that's what the restoration opportunities assessment methodology tries to help countries walk through, subnational jurisdictions. What, how many jobs could be generated by the degraded lands that have been identified? What's the economic return that's going to be issued to both government, smallholder, tenant? And these are the sorts of information that actually need to be there in order to overcome some of the preconditions to finance that are existing within the World Bank financing of the multilateral trust funds or at the domestic decision-making table. One of the examples that I would give of how Rome has been applied and, and the development of it that I find sort of quite appealing, actually, is in the case of Guatemala, who has really become a leader within the Central American region on restoration, have said, okay, I have an existing subsidy program, Rural Economic Development Program. What I'd like to do is expand that out. I have a large program I'm going to run. Uh, I'd like to, to operate under my national forest and climate strategy but I don't have enough funding to do it. So let's look at where the degraded lands already exist, and let's target my national program to the, re the sub-regions or the provinces and states that most specifically need it. And then what I'm gonna say is, what are my drivers of de degradation in that area? I know that degradation is my key issue. So I can now look at that and say, okay, I have two existing activities that I subsidized through this program. I'm gonna expand that to seven to cover the full suite of drivers of degradation that are there, and I know it's gonna generate jobs. I know roughly how many working with the national institutes. And I'm able to actually move forward at the, de at the decision making table to say, this is what we can expect as an outcome. This is why this isn't simply a forestry agency issue. I need to create an enabling environment of decision makers around cabinet to step up and say, yes, I'm the minister of agriculture and the impact on food crop yields is this. That's why it's in my interest. And so I think that's where, without getting into all the, the depths of the tool necessarily, and I encourage you to go to iucn.org slash ROAM to get the, the shameless plug from me, as well as the information that might help you move forward some of the processes. But I thought what I might do is leave it there, um, leave a little bit of time for questions and answers afterwards, and just highlight that I think the, the idea of uptake pathways for us has been, we've always had theories of change. Um, thinking about uptake pathways and how you get from the existing user base to actual behavioral change in a specific user group has been really useful. Um, and I look forward to working with others to figure out how we can make more of that happen. Thank you, Patrick. And up <laughs> Next up, we have Sven Wunder. He's the principal economist at C4. And he'll be talking about the Poverty and Environment Network. Uh, Good afternoon. Um, so, I will talk to you a bit about uh, the Poverty and Environment Network and how that 
a, a data set created uh, uh, by us could also be used as a tool for, for sustainable uh, uh, landscape management. And to start, of, start you off uh, with a little bit of uh, background on what PEN, uh, uh, Poverty and Environment Network, what it is. Um, so it's, uh, it's a collection uh, across the, uh, the tropics and subtropics of the, uh, uh, using the same questionnaire, we, we generate comparable data. We try to use the best methodologies available. Uh, and we've been using uh, mainly PhD uh, students to, uh, to gather those data. Uh, uh, and what is it all about? It's mainly on household economics and where people get their income from. And the central research question that we wanted to answer is, you know, how much a, uh, income actually comes from forest and, and environmental, that is, non-cultivated uh, resources. Um, C4 has been uh, the coordinating body, body for this, but it's been a highly collaborative effort with a lot of uh, institutions participating. And one could say it's kind of a huge bean counting exercise uh, because there are many small uh, contributions from forests that are often in, 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 in regular household surveys uh, done nationally, they will not be considered. Uh, but they can, uh, the sum of them can be, can be important. Um, so basically, this is not a policy research uh, effort in the sense that we're investigating one specific intervention, but uh, it's more of a basic research. And here you can see uh, a little bit of where we've been working. Um, uh, 24 countries, uh, 360 villages, more than 8,000 households, and we used a, a methodology where we uh, uh, gathered data over, over a full year with quarterly surveys, for surveys. Um, now, this was not a random sample. So in a, in a world uh, where uh, that is getting increasingly heterogeneous, you have to be critical of you know, how was the sample actually gathered. So um, let me elaborate a, a little bit on that. Uh, as a criteria, we had sort of we wanted rural areas in the in tropical and subtropical regions of of developing countries, and there should be some access to forests, uh, since that was our particular interest. Uh, uh, so there should not be zero forest cover, but also we excluded some of the uh, almost 100% forest cover deep inside the forest with indigenous. Uh, uh, hunter and gatherer societies, etc. We are more interested in the smallholder uh, 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 scenarios in between. Um, but we had to. Uh, we are mostly uh, uh, had to follow the PhD students in their choices of of sites. In some cases, we were able to to also influence uh, uh, where they did their studies. Um, within the sites, we used a stratified uh, selection of villages according to uh, some predefined gradients of background variables such as, you know, closeness to roads, density of the uh, of, uh, population, uh, indigenous versus, uh, versus uh, uh, mixed uh, colonial type of uh, backgrounds, etc. And then within the villages, we used uh, a random selection of households. So we also back tested then afterwards, you know, some of how representative is the, the sample that we got, and um, we think we can say that it's broadly representative of of the smallholder dominated uh, uh, landscapes in the tropics and subtropics, with moderate to good access to forest resources. Um, there's probably a slight bias towards areas with good good forest resources. Uh, uh, compared to what is the rural developing world as such, and, and Africa is a bit oversampled over compared to the other two developing continents. Now, we talk about tools, you know, one thing that was important is also the, uh, we've tried to, to summarize what we learned about uh, the methods that we've been using, and uh, uh, produced this uh, Earthscan book, uh, which is uh, also available on the, on the C4 website for, for download. Um, we also produced a, the prototype questionnaire that's available on our websites in eight different languages. Um, 
And one of the feedback we got from, from one of our biggest donors, ESRC from the UK, is that well, maybe those methods that you produced are just as important as, as the results uh, as such. Um, for the results, we, uh, we uh, have a special issue in world development that is electronically available already and will be out uh, here in December, actually, uh, in, in, in print. There's a summary article. Then there's one about the livelihoods uh, economic analysis, one about uh, the use of forest as uh, safety nets, uh, one on the gender dimensions, um, one on forest uh, clearing and its role in livelihoods, uh, and one on tenure. And then as, as an example, we also have a sort of a comparative case study. And those are in this special issue combined with some other uh, uh, contributions. And they are also f uh, available for free download as uh, open access articles on the CIFA websites. So what did we find in terms of the, uh, the income uh, results? Uh, well, on average, we found that 22% uh, uh, of uh, income comes from forests and 64 comes from other environmental extractive resources. Uh, so together, they make up 27.5%, which is almost as big as, as uh, crop income. And, and that certainly uh, uh, supports an, uh, the hypothesis that, that there are high environmental incomes. And, and I must say, some of us, including myself, were quite surprised about how, how high it was uh, uh, in, in our sample. Um, so maybe the main co conclusion that we uh, that we got away with, uh, or that we came away with, was that, that more than 10,000 years after the start of the agricultural revolution, uh, there's still a, uh, a lot of smallholders in the rural tropics uh, who derive just as much income from foraging as they do from, from uh, cultivating crops. So what about uh, outcomes and, and uh, uptake of these uh, results? Um, Initially, I'm just showing you uh, uh, on our website, as we, uh, we have the publications for free download, we've been gathering data on who is accessing this, this information. And as you can see, not surprisingly, uh, uh, there is, uh, the biggest group is uh, research uh, and coming from academ academic institutions, but actually also a, a lot of people working in, in for instance, development and <coughs> conservation programs. Uh, coming from, uh, in particular, uh, the NGO community, international and national NGOs, uh, have been downloading our information. Um, but what about the data itself? Uh, we had from the beginning a vision that uh, this should be, uh, be used as, uh, as an entry point to, uh, to perhaps uh, reform some of the uh, uh, living standard measurement surveys that, that the World Bank and, 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 uh, and, and countries in developing countries are doing and are using for, uh, for informing their, their poverty alleviation strategies, uh, so as to include those products uh, and, and income sources that we find as, as being the most important in those particular regions and countries uh, that we are looking into. So we want them to be able to do a better job in doing that environmental bean, bean counting. Um, and now we are working with a, a, in a joint project with FAO, a, the World Bank itself, the LSMS group, a, our NOFOR partner a, PROFOR, and, and others in developing a forestry module for, for, for the LSMS, which will be uh, tested in Indonesia uh, and in Tanzania. Um, but also, we're here for, for, uh, for doing something about climate change, uh, and uh, what can we use PEN data, uh, in, in, in how in, can we use the, the data in that, in that respect? Um, well, for one, you could uh, get to know something more about the opportunity costs for interventions like RED by knowing more about you know, how much income do people actually get out of, out of the, uh, the forest resources uh, locally. Um, so that could be important for the mitigation part. But what we are looking into now is uh, we're trying to uh, analyze uh, 
climate data for our sites, which we've uh, gathered historical climate data, and we try to find out what cross-sectional patterns we can, we can see and how, a, a, how differences in climate uh, over time and across the sample could make uh, for uh, differences in explain, co-explain differences in, in income generation. And I'm just showing you here uh, is uh, some of the, the raw data that we, uh, that we just downloaded and, uh, and are starting to work with. Uh, uh, so these are uh, the rainfall and temperature for, for our villages in the pen sample uh, and how it has changed over the last 30 years. Uh, and it's pretty much, the temperature change is pretty much in line with what you, uh, what you have across the rural tropics as a, in terms of uh, increasing, slightly increasing temperature so far. Uh, but probably the rainfall patterns are, are, are quite, are more important for, for some of the results. And you can look at the fluctuations as well, the standard deviation on those, on those two variables. Uh, some might expect, you know, that you get much bigger fluctuations. Uh, we have not seen that so far in, in, in our sample. Uh, there's, there's, there's no trend of increasing uh, fluctuations in, in uh, rainfall and, and, and temperature. Um, so our idea is then to use these things uh, econometrically, uh, and specifically we are, with this ex exercise, contributing to a, a flagship report that the, uh, that the World Bank is planning for the, the, the COP in Paris about uh, poverty and, and climate change. So, so we, this is an input in a, in, in a team effort uh, that is developing uh, in, these, uh, in these coming months. So I'll finish with a couple of pictures from, uh, from, our, uh, from our forest products and environmental products across the, uh, the tropics. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to Eric, to Rodrigo, Sven, and to Patrick. And now we'd actually like to open up the space for discussion. And in case anyone has any comments or any questions to the panelists or any ideas they'd like to share. Any questions? Any innovative tools to, sh to share with the rest of the group? No? OK, well, OK, yep, please go ahead. Shouldn't be the one asking a question, but I mean, to, to, to Patrick, I mean, for as, as long as I've been trained as, well as a sort of forester, I mean, you have the whole issue that, in fact, restoration is something that costs you money, but there is no really thing that is bringing you money. So, c can you give us really some example? Of it? Is it really worth investing in restoration? I think there's there's two parts probably that, to that response. Uh, if we look at some of the movements on, you know, ending deforestation by 2020 under things like the New York Declaration on Forests or on some of the, the zero net deforestation commitments in commodity supply chains, which are making good progress to 60% of palm oil production being not coming from, def you know, coming from deforestation free supply chains. The question for those large corporate commitments and for land use change really then becomes where do commodities come from? If we're using them on the existing land base, that's one thing. But we also need to, we saw just in the first presentation that the demands on land are growing, the demands on food are growing, and that we're likely to lose large areas that are available for actual commodity production. So the question then becomes, where do we find the difference? And I think a large part of that is understanding what is needed to actually restore those lands. So then the next step to that response would then say, you know, it costs too much. And we hear that frequently. Um, I think part of it sometimes comes down to an interpretation of what landscape restoration is, and that's part of what we've been able to unpack a bit more. This isn't simply afforestation and reforestation. We're talking about a full suite of activities. We're talking about agroforestry systems. We're talking about farm fallow systems. We're talking about mangrove and coastal restoration, disaster risk reduction activities on slope sides. And when we start looking at the full set of, we always talk about the cost side of it. And we can bring in cultural values and we can bring in all sorts of aesthetic values. But what we've tried to focus on in the countries that we're working with, and it was a shame I didn't mention it when he was still here, but you know, we've recently signed an agreement 
building on this work um, be signed between IUCN and UNEP um, to help integrate some of these assessment methodologies into all 55 countries of the UN RED program to provide technical outreach, to develop regional hubs to assist with restoration issues. And so the question to, to actually directly respond to it, what's actually needed is to move past the thinking about the costs of establishing an exotic teak plantation and start breaking that down into, as the case of a country in Central America that hasn't, revealed, that hasn't released the analysis yet, but if you look at existing agricultural and forestry subsidy programs, some of those we know within subsidy reform that there are large costs to the treasury for paying for results that would have happened anyways, or for simply incentive payments that did not result in anything. And if you start looking at those payments and saying, what if I were, if I recognize that I have five, 10, $15 billion in existing subsidies, both tax and direct incentives, what if I could actually get better climatic and societal outcomes from those incentive programs while reducing the cost to treasury? Then all of a sudden we're starting to reduce the actual cost per hectare of some of those interventions. So there's ways to modify some of the existing subsidy programs that already exist once you understand the dynamics of those land interventions. So I, I would not on the surface of it challenge the assumption necessarily that land, landscape restoration costs too much, but would say that we know that the demands on lands are increasing, we know that the amount of variable land is decreasing, and that we are going to have to make better use of where the world's previously standing primary forests used to be. If I, if I can add some, some thoughts about Brazil, because uh, y y your question is so important because there's people that continue to think that uh, if we need more land, let's deforestate, let's cut down the trees and let's uh, continue expanding and then it gets degraded, let's continue expanding. But uh, the resources are exhaustible and, and there's no way to continue like this. This is, this is uh, a, a very clear understanding. And, and the fact that the, the challenge is how to, to manage different stakeholders from the public and from the private sector to, to understand this situation and to work for cutting the deforestation, and cutting the need for new land to produce. Of course, we need to expand production, but if we cannot deforestate, or if we're aiming to achieve a zero net deforestation, we will be able to bring land that is not productive anymore into suitable land, right? So to, to be able to, to, to make this equation work, uh, we, we, we have in Brazil, for example, the, the, the low carbon agricultural plan that is one of one of the components of the Brazilian NEMA uh, that has one of the targets is to recover 15 million hectares of pasture, degraded pasture land. 15 million hectares until 2020. If we're able to do that, and there's technologies to do that available, the point is money. A producer cannot just loan money uh, to recover, let's say, 500 hectares of degraded pasture without a very good project because he needs to be able to get a loan to recover those land and make it profitable in the coming years. So the, the, the difficult issue is, is how to make, to put money in this. And there's a very clear sign from the public sector that there must be subsidies for this, there must be incentives for this. Uh, together with the forest code, uh, there's the obligation of restoring uh, the forested area, at least part of it, uh, and it will re rely on the size of the farm and when it was deforested, there's a lot of different aspects mm -hmm. of it. And, and one of the pillar of the forest code, the new forest code, that, that it was supposed to to be in place with the old forest code, but was never in place, is the program 
of incentives for those who, who are conserving and for those who will restore. Because without this, we're going to have it, but not in the scale we need. So just to sum up, recovering the graded pasture to, to become productive again is a way to tackle the zero deforestation or the zero net deforestation target. Moreover, if we can recover degraded land or pasture to forest, to native forest, to allow adaptation, resilience of, of the, the local communities, it's the second best. So how to really manage this and to get stakeholders involved and, and engaging stakeholders is crucial. There's no, there's no, there's no point just from, from the, the, the big players to say, I don't buy from you anymore if there's no engagement and, and, and actions aiming to, to apply this. Uh, we, we, we work with different stakeholders in different sectors in Brazil. And there's a, a, a common understanding about a lot of things. Um, and, and basically everyone understands that, that achieving zero net deforestation is the way. Mm. The problem is how to get there and, 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 and leave the, the, the phase of pilot projects and really go to a, a, a huge scale of this kind of project. Thank you, Sven and uh, Patrick. Well, about engaging stakeholders, we have a question from one of our audience. Please go ahead. Yes, um, thank you, Madam Moderator. First, I thank colleagues for um, quite uh, this innovative um, <coughs> uh, presentations. And uh, <laughs> sorry, maybe. Okay, just um, let me be straightforward. Two questions and one comment. The first question is, um, how is it possible for, uh, for the team about up there on the panel to try to help us develop tools uh, for tracking sustainable management uh, financing? As you know, um, the Standing Committee on Finance now <coughs> is looking at uh, how it is, it, it, is, it is looking at how the different modalities for financing the forest. So how can you help to inform that work? Secondly, to the colleague from C4, um, we talked of the poverty environment <coughs> network. And to me, I was plucking my head on what experiences we have from the Poverty Environment Initiative. And in this way, I'm saying, uh, uh, um, how, how is the Poverty Environment Network maybe contributing more on the work of the Poverty Environment Initiative, what it was doing with some developing countries? Lastly is um, about the network being uh, an academic, because you showed it has so many collections of PhD candidates who are synthesizing data. And as you know, C4 is known for really being explicit in data and information on uh, the forests. But my thinking would be now that amidst all these data sets you have, um, how do you further guide in, in national policy making processes such that governments can also use your data efficiently and effectively. Thank you very much. Thank you. Who would like to start with answering that? Um, so the Poverty and Environment Initiative, could you? Uh, I actually don't know, uh, doesn't ring any bell. Can you explain a little bit what that is about? Okay. Uh, there is this Poverty Environment Initiative, which is a collaboration between the UNEP and the UNDP, uh, which is looking at mainstreaming environment into national programming in most LDCs. 
and uh, it, has, it, has, it has somehow been a bit slow. And my link is how does the poverty environment network, mm -hmm. which you have now, maybe contribute or can further move the work which was already done okay. by the I'm, I know the poverty and environment partnership, and that's also one of the outlets. That's like a donor group that uh, works on these issues, and we were also uh, have that on our list of of uh, of, uh, of possible uptake uh, uh, agencies who could be interested in in our in our results. Um, and then the other questions were about uh, the data sets. And what did you, what, what you were asking about the data sets exactly? Or you can use it at the government and national level. Yeah. I mean, the, the, st the next step is to, uh, to uh, get it into uh, uh, national representative surveys, like, like the LSMS, and, and generate data that are, that are useful at the national level. Because now we just have some uh, point studies, you know, like one or two studies in India and in uh, one in Indonesia, etc. That's not nationally representative as such. So, but but it will be, uh, be able to give some information about what what kind of products you should gather information on, and then from that you can uh, uh, you have a more consolidated information about about socioeconomics in in the rural tropics. That's the idea. Thank you. Uh, does anybody else have any uh, questions to our panelists? On? Yes, please go ahead. Uh, yes, sure. Um, can we just have one minute first, please? For yeah, just to pick up on your question about tracking financing, I think uh, you know clearly there's there, there are new instruments coming online all the time. The bank has a fairly detailed website as to what it is that the the, the various instruments that we're involved with, and that would be an important place to start. But I know most of the bilateral uh, donor agencies also have uh, specific websites. I think what I'll do is happy to point you to the to the bank websites where you can see the, you know, how the climate investment funds are sort of split between mitigation and adaptation uh, uh, op uh, op options. So that would be one place you could start. There's quite a few options there, but uh, we can take it from there and see what else are your your needs are. And just to to build on that, I mean. I think it was about two and a half years ago, there was a pretty good overview of the forest financing, uh, both sustainable forest management and climate under the United Nation Forum on Forests, um, which is gonna be meeting again this March, but there was a good overview um, as they talk about a trust fund, as has been the case for a number of years. There was an overview of the forest financing's <laughs> existing flows, not necessarily tied to climate finance, which is well summarized by the Voluntary Red Database um, which has just been uh, a week ago, actually, just in this building, was announced that it was going to move to, uh, I believe, the FAO. Um, there were a number of others that were interested. But, so there's a number of avenues out there, including the Voluntary Red Database, um, RedX, which is run by Forest Trends, uh, and then also you have, under the UNF, UN Forum on Forests, there's also an overview of the existing sustainable forest financing mechanisms. Yeah. My, my question is for, for Sven as well. Um, I have sometimes the, <clears throat> the feeling and the concern that when we talk about restoration, we think that it, it, we, we look more at the technical aspect than at what, who is living there, what are they doing. And I recently, I've seen a paper about uh, cacao in the state of Pará and you could plant one million hectares of cacao and it's just based like on, on soils and and these people are ranchers and there must be a reason for them being ranchers and not being a cacao producer then of course the market might drive some changes changes in that but do we assume that it's very easy to to see a shift in the in the livelihood strategy of a smallholder that's okay I'm a rancher and and next year I will start with cacao or or, or are there based, for example, on, on the result of PEN? What, what is your perception about this, this, uh, this challenge that I see as the real challenge? Because these, these areas are degraded, but they are not empty. It's full of people. So. 
I think uh, yes, you are you are right about that, but uh, it's not something we can say so much about from the pen data because it's just a snapshot. I mean, what would be interesting to to do is to uh, to do a panel, and we are sort of uh, loosely thinking about that whether to go back to some of these pen sites uh, some years from now and and see some of the changes over time. But right now we just have sort of a cross-sectional. A pattern to look at, so so we can't exactly answer these these questions. Yeah, just just to pick up on that, I think uh, one of the things that we were trying to show in the study is that it's it's extremely risky to do that kind of projection without understanding how climate is going to change. Uh, the, one of the hi hypotheses in the room is that a lot of decisions are being taken at the moment without any notion of what climate change is coming down the road. Um, and, and that's, that's very risky. Um, one, of the, one of the stories we hear very often is that traditional knowledge is extremely important in this, and it is. But uh, several of the leaders, when you talk to them, said there's no cultural baseline in current community toolkits that allow them to sort of understand what is happening in terms of just planting dates, etc. So, I mean, this is quite basic to many of our communities. They sort of say, take some, you know, reasonably robust decisions. How do you make those decisions under uncertainty is, is a sub subject of much uh, uh, research at the moment. Uh, so I think this is, this is something we have to be careful about. Uh, you keep hearing about, oh, yeah, this is the way to go. But, you know, much of the stuff that we're doing, uh, when we talk about landscapes, a landscape could be several hundred kilometers by several hundred kilometers. So what you do within a region of five to 50 or even 100 communities may be only a subset of that landscape. And that is gonna have local impacts as well as downstream or upstream impacts. Uh, and, and, then, and understanding what those might be, not only in spatial terms, but in, over time is tricky. So this is why we have to sort of uh, bring all this information together. It's very, very risky, some of the, 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 the efforts to sort of try and you know, provide communities with tools without the solid, uh, robust uh, data sets that might give them pathways uh, forward. Uh, looking at historical data sets is very, very risky at the moment. And so if you, I mean, if you build on that and look at some of the work that's been done in Ghana and Mexico and Guatemala and Rwanda, and now increasingly Uganda, and the list goes on of new countries using some of these tools. If you look at it from just taking your point on, yes, there's the biophysical possibility and we've seen countries that have moved forward with national legislation just on biophysical possibility. In some cases, that's bringing together the very basic soil productivity, degraded, degraded, uh, degraded lands, maps that already exist, land cover, and then there's sort of a next step sometimes. That might be enough. Just bringing those together as a basic might be a point. Um, one of the things that we found through our work with partners is that, that some, even in that basic step, some of the miscommunications that are occurring and some of the conflicts that exist after some of those changes are actually a result of errors in the data sets. That by starting with participatory mapping and validation of the input data sets into some of those processes, you can identify that in areas that is um, identified as degraded or out of production is actually in a rotational cropping system. That it might actually be in a point of recovery so if you just look at tenure, that might not actually catch it. Or if you look at degradation, that might not catch it. So when you take that biophysical possibility map and you start looking at that without having looked at the input data sets with the same stakeholders, you could have taken all that very useful local knowledge that's part of that from the beginning and said, well, maybe we didn't need a, a full day workshop going through and participatory mapping the output if we had started at the beginning. Then you can take it a step further and say, well, does it make sense to restore an area that's not going to have, that's going to have a, a salinated water table as a result of some of the climate projections or won't be deemed arable as a result of some of the climate scenario models? Then you're moving from biophysical possibility to future scenario. And then you can start reducing out areas that aren't economically viable. There are going to be areas where it doesn't make sense to have an entire livelihood shift exactly as you were suggesting, to go from one modality, uh, you know, one simple production system to a completely different product. That might not be viable, but an example that I would give locally just to then hand it back over is 
if you look at uh, San Martin in, here in Peru in the Altamayo Protected Forest, how do you address de degradation on illegal lands, uh, on a legally issued title that was false title that was issued within a protected area to settlers that have moved? You can either have forced migration or you can deal with the situation at hand, which is for a hectare or two hectare parcel of land that someone has growing coffee and a mixture of agroforestry crops on a hillside that has to chase an extra half hectare of production every year because they have a fixed contract for coffee. How do you deal with that? To try and reduce that half hectare of chasing yields each year, you're, the Conservation International working as a, a conservation agency for the government of Peru in the Altamayo Protected Forest said, well, let's look at not cash payments to someone. Let's actually look at trying to overcome the problem of the rust that's causing the decreased yields. Let's look at extension services within an existing livelihood system and say, continue what you're doing. Let's enter a conservation agreement together and together we'll work forward to try and overcome the issue that's causing the deforestation and the further degradation of the existing piece of land. So I think that's where sometimes we can work within an existing livelihood and a, a, a means of production without having to necessarily change completely some of the, the larger models. As long as they don't take that more profitable model and implement it on more lands, of course. Just to, just to touch upon your, your example, uh, the government of Brazil, uh, the Ministry of Agriculture, did uh, uh, agroecological zoning of palm oil in the Amazon. And the government approved a program uh, based on this agroecological zoning to really bring incentives for small producers to produce palm oil in the Amazon provided that there's no deforestation. There's just degraded land or abandoned land that was deforestated for so some reason, like illegal logging, for example, or for cattle ranching. And this, if this is, uh, we have the, the agroecological zoning already in place. And small farmers are starting to produce palm oil. It seems crazy, right, to say palm oil in an Amazon in the same sentence seems, no, no, I don't want that. Yeah, but this is starting to take place. And you can put, you can bring people, ranchers, very with low productivity, with low uh, genetic and low capacity to produce and to sustain its family with beef or, or even milk that will generate deforestation in one way or another to produce palm oil in, in a very coordinated way and manner. And this can happen with cacao, for example. Brazil is, again, starting to be very um, uh, proactive in cacao. Uh, again, in the state of Bahia mainly, but in, in some other states also. So. Yes, there's space for this, and in Brazil, it's one of the ways to to get small farmers, small holders that are with low productivity, that are basically producing to eat for subsistence and to make their profitable. And this will, would be a way how policies can can be managed and and to really change uh, the idea of subsistence to to business and, and, and with cacao that is a very knowledgeable and, and a very um, high, high income product. So, but, but must, must have the, the, this policy very based on, on data and on planning really to try to, to avoid a deforestation that can, can happen. Thank you. Well, thank you, everyone. Do we have any final question before we close up? No? Nope. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining in in this session. And thank you for all our panelists for your experiences, for sharing your experiences and insights. And uh, to close up, well, I would like to invite you to uh, sample this, uh, a piece of Lebanese sweets. And this is a uh, sweet that's been sustainably grown. The ingredients, including pine nuts, uh, pistachios, and uh, 
almond nuts. So I'm going to open that right now. But I think we might have to leave the room, so maybe we can move this outside. And thank you, everyone, for joining in. <laughs> Round of applause.